السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله all praise is indeed due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his household his companions may Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless every single one of us and grant us goodness in this world as well as the next my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam. Surah to Shura, we spoke about yesterday. We are going to continue, inshallah. It is Surah number 42 of the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it makes mention of how the provision of this particular world is very little compared to that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for the believers after death. And this is why we need to save ourselves from the loss of the hereafter by preparing while in this world for that particular journey. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for every one of us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those who believe and they lay their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the ones who will find that that which Allah has in store for them is everlasting in comparison to that which is in this world, which is very little and very short-lived. So Allah says in verse number 36, Everything that you have been given on earth here is only but provision of this particular world. It is not valid for the hereafter. You cannot use it anywhere else besides on earth. The clothing you have now, it's for this earth. Whatever you have in terms of monetary items will only be usable while you're on earth. The minute you leave the earth, everything you had in terms of materialistic things becomes unusable. It's no longer valid for the akhirah. If you've ever thought of it, what do you have? You have your clothing, say the cotton, it's from the ground, it's from the earth, right? Say you have leather, leather is from the cow, for example, it's from the earth. Say you have metal and steel, where is it from? The earth, everything is taken from the globe for you, O oh man. It was placed on the globe in order to be used on the globe. When you leave, you have to leave it all behind. It stops, expired, gone. After that, Allah says, وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ That which is with Allah is better. It is better and it is everlasting for those who believe and lay their full trust in Allah. I've laid my trust in Allah. We've all laid our trust in Allah. We know that when we die, we will definitely go to a better place. It cannot be a worse place than this dunya. We have suffered enough. We have struggled enough. We have been through difficulties, hardship. We've worked day in, day out in order to earn, in order to survive, in order to have a plate of food. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not let that happen to the believers in the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you believe and you lay your full trust in Allah, you will be convinced that definitely what is with Allah is everlasting. And this is why the next few verses, Allah speaks of the qualities of those who truly believe and who lay their trust in Allah. You see, when you and I lay our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we add into the entire equation of life something known as preparation for the hereafter by pleasing Allah. So when I have a problem with someone, there are three elements. Myself, the person I have a problem with, and Allah. Sometimes I may forgive them for the sake of Allah, even though I have a problem, because I want to please Allah, because I want to prepare for the hereafter. This is what I mean. You add Allah into the equation because you're a believer. Those who don't believe, they don't add Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into the equation. So Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يَجْتَنِبُونَ كَبَائِرَ الْإِثْمِ وَالْفَوَاحِشِ The first qualities, those who keep away from major sin, they have laid their full trust in Allah. They are the true believers in Allah. They keep away from major sin and immorality. 
Immorality is not just adultery and fornication and pornography, etc. It includes foul language, foul speech, immoral dress. Is all included in fahisha. It's included in the term immoral. So those who abstain from immorality, they are the ones who have pleased their maker. They are the ones who have saved themselves from the torment of this world as well as the next. And Allah continues to say, وَإِذَا مَا غَضِبُوهُمْ يَغْفِرُونَ An amazing quality. Those whom when they become angry, they quickly forgive. They quickly forgive. Some people, it takes them very long to become angry. When they become angry, they very quickly return back to normal. Those are the best of people. The best. It doesn't take you, meaning it takes you a very long time to become upset. And when you become upset, within a split second, you're, you're laughing again, you're smiling, and you're back to normal. May Allah make us from those. Those are the best of people. Trust me, you have to work very hard to get to that. You have to force yourself to protect yourself from anger. Anger is something that the Prophet ﷺ has warned. One day a young man came to Rasulullah ﷺ and says, Oh Sunni ya Rasulullah, give me some advice, O Messenger ﷺ. Imagine you're meeting the Messenger, peace be upon him, the greatest of creation, and you're asking him, please give me advice. You know, you would expect him to sit you down and to give you a nice long lecture. Perhaps, you know, in our case, if there was a sheikh or someone, you'd sit with your notepad and write a few notes. He just said, La taghdab. Done. Don't get angry. The man looked. He says, give me more advice. He says, don't get angry. Second time. The man looked and says, give me more advice. He says, don't get angry. Subhanallah. He kept repeating it. So it was needed for him and a lesson for us to say, don't get angry is a whole lecture. It is an entire lecture. It is so important. If I were to get up and say, don't get angry and walk away, I think you would get angry. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. But the point being raised is, it is so important, it means there is an effort required to protect yourself from anger. Save yourself from the disaster of your own anger. Because I promise you, anger and temper is something that can really cause major disasters in your life. Be careful, calm down, calm down, relax. Say, A'udhu Billahi min ash shaitan rajim I seek Allah's protection from shaitan, the accursed. If you're standing, sit down. If you're sitting, lie down. Perhaps have a sip of water, subhanallah. You may want to hold some of that water in your mouth so that you don't utter any utterances while you're angry. Because when you're angry and you open your mouth, you have to regret what you say. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So this is why Allah says thereafter, Allah says, وَإِذَا مَا غَضِبُوهُمْ يَغْفِرُونَ وَالَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةِ Those who answered the call of Allah and they establish their salah. If you establish your salah generally, you would become more conscious of your relationship with Allah. And you would realize that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whom you need to please. Because you are going to go back to him. A few days ago, someone asked me about how to respond to a person who's atheistic. A person who doesn't believe perhaps at all. And they say, how do you know you are correct as a Muslim? How do you know that what you're doing is right? Very simple. I can quickly tell you. I worship whoever made me. I came from somewhere. Whoever it was, I call him Allah. He is Allah, my God. He is the one who has created me. I put my head on the ground for him and I say, Oh, you who made me, you are the greatest, you are the highest. He is in control of every aspect of my existence. I call him Rabbun. Rabb actually means the creator, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, curer, etc. You need to memorize this because that is who Rabb is. So if I say, Glory be to my Rabb. It means whoever made me, glory be to you. Whoever is in control of every aspect of my existence, glory be to you. What is wrong with that statement? And I worship the one whom I'm going to return to when I die. So when my eyes close, wherever I'm going to go back, I know it's the one who made me in the first place. I put my head on the ground and I say, Oh, you whom I'm going to return to when I return to you, have mercy on me. What risk have I taken? Zero. There is no risk factor. I haven't taken any risk whatsoever because I have worshipped whoever made me and whoever I'm going to return to. However, the person who perhaps doesn't believe at all, they believe that you're on earth, you enjoy and you're going to die and it's over. 
Now let's study probabilities for a minute. So if I were to worship Allah for argument's sake, if there was nothing on the other side, what have I lost? Nothing. Why? Because if there was nothing on the other side, I'm still going to get to the other side with nothing. There's going to be nothing. Astaghfirullah. We don't believe that, but I'm just saying it for argument's sake. And if a person does not worship Allah and there is on the other side what we're saying, you stand to lose. Subhanallah. So if you are to worship, you'll never lose. Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. We worship with conviction, not probabilities. We worship with conviction, but we are just answering with the probability to say, look, we are more right than you are because according to you, you are taking a huge risk. You don't even know what's there to come. And according to you, even if I keep on worshiping, I'm going to end up where you will end up. That's what you believe. But I believe if you don't worship, you are not going to end up where I end up. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. I hope you've got the gist of what I've said. It's actually a very powerful point if you understand it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to say, Wa amruhum shura bainahum. Those who believe in Allah and who lay their trust in Allah. Whenever there is an important matter that needs to be decided in their lives, they consult. They consult. They consult those who are near them, those who are genuine, those who are sincere. We touched on it yesterday and I've just mentioned it today. And then verse number 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains to us that you know what? Those who bad is done against them, they have the right to defend themselves. If someone does bad, you have the right to defend yourself. Someone attacks you, you have the right to defend yourself. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if someone does evil to you, the recompense of evil is evil. But whoever forgives and makes amends, their reward is with Allah. It's not easy to forgive. In the same way, we transgress against Allah. We want him to forgive us. Well, when others hurt you, harm you, transgress against you, have a big heart. Forgive them for the sake of Allah. I promise you, you will save yourself from adverse health conditions. Many people hold burdens and this burden weighs them down completely because they do not find it within them to forgive someone. You may not forget, but you can forgive. You can say, you know what? It's okay. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive this person. I don't want to deal with them too much, but I've forgiven them. That's not wrong. But if you were to embrace thereafter and there is amends on both sides, then it becomes easier to make amends. You see, if there is forgiveness on one side and not on the other, it's good for the person who's forgiven, but it may not make it easy for you to interact with the person thereafter because they don't want to forgive you, for example, or they don't think they were wrong sometimes. But when there is forgiveness on both sides, it becomes easier for you to embrace. Brothers and sisters, learn to admit your fault. Learn to admit it. Learn to search how you might have been wrong. That's a very good quality actually. When you look within you, perhaps I did something wrong. Perhaps I am the one who caused this. Maybe look into yourself. Yes, you may be right. But there's no harm in looking into yourself to ensure that you are not the one who was wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. And wherever we have been blatantly and openly wrong, may we be strong enough to admit and to apologize. You know, to seek an apology is actually not genuine. If I say, I expect an apology from you, you might say, I'm sorry, without meaning it, because I've demanded it from you. But without demanding if it were to come, listen brother, I'm very sorry. It is genuine and sincere. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to apologize before it is demanded of us. I mean, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the importance of forgiving and how he loves it when we forgive each other. I think it's an important quality to look into. Month of Ramadan, inshallah, let's make amends. I'm sure a lot of us have issues with people around us, sometimes family members. I think these are the last 10 nights and it wouldn't be a wrong call to actually call on myself and yourselves to try and make amends as best as possible, inshallah, to resolve matters in these beautiful days of Ramadan. Let's move on to Surah Zukhruf, which is Surah number 43 of the Quran. In it, I touched on a few verses yesterday, but I'm going to speak about jealousy. When Allah has blessed one person, 
Sometimes others are not happy at that blessing. They become sad. A Muslim is he or she who becomes happy at the happiness or profit or gain of the other and is sad when someone loses. But sadly, shaitan comes to us and makes us become happy when someone loses and we say, yes, it's good, they deserved it. Be careful of those statements. They are not healthy at all. When you see someone achieving, they came first, they were tops, they came out right at the top, they earned, they made profit, they were elected, they were perhaps appointed, they had something going on for them which was really good. They married someone, perhaps you might have thought you may wanted to have married. Good luck to them. Make dua for them, mashallah. Subhanallah. Be happy for them. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them success. And may Allah open their doors. When you make dua for the success of another, the angels are making the same dua for you. Remember that. So you say, oh Allah, grant him a thousand. The angels are saying, oh Allah, grant him a thousand too. Allahu Akbar. Let's make dua for each other, inshallah, that we become multi-millionaires. What do you say? I mean, in the dunya and the akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. I don't know why when it comes to the duas, we always talk about money. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> May Allah forgive us. Wallahi, forgiveness is more important than, Allah, than, than, than the amassing of wealth. The forgiveness from Allah is more important than the amassing of wealth. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَحْمَةُ رَبِّكَ خَيْرٌ مِّمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ Straight to the point. The mercy of your Lord is better than whatever they amass. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us. Amen. So at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know that Allah chose. Allah chose an orphan child to be the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets. And this is a consolation to all those who are orphaned. Subhanallah. To say the most beloved to Allah was an orphan as well. The one whom Allah chose to be the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets, Khatamun Nabiyyin, the one whom to mention his name would be insulting without saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was an orphan. Subhanallah. Allah chose him. That's a consolation. Those children who are orphaned, we are meant to be treating them differently, with utmost respect, differently as in far better than the ordinary child. The same applies to widows. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who can reach out genuinely to those in need. I mean, so when Allah appointed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the messenger, some people became jealous. Who was jealous? The rich, the powerful, those in authority, the haughty, those whom everyone looked up to. They became very upset because they would have expected one of them to become a leader, to become a prophet. Why is this man who was brought up not even by his own father, chosen by Allah? My brothers and sisters, Allah chooses whom he wants. Allah gives whom he wants what he wants. You have to thank Allah for what he has bestowed upon you. Thank Allah for what he has given others and do not be jealous. For jealousy will eat your good deeds in the same way that a flame would eat a dry log. According to the hadith, Inna al -hasada ya kulul hasanat kama ta narul hatab. We, we need to be careful that our deeds are not wasted. Save your deeds. Because when you have jealousy, you have enmity, you have hatred, it develops into a war between you and someone. You come into the masjid, you hate this one, you dislike that one, you're jealous of this one. You see someone with a new car, you see someone with a new house, you start thinking this person is a robber, this person is a thief, this one dealt with in drugs, and this one made his money money through interest etc why are you concerned about the lives of others worry about yourself did they pinch from you no well then forget about everything carry on with your own life a lot of the people who point don't realize that three fingers are pointing back at them they are sometimes in hotter soup than the people they are talking about and they don't realize may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us so this is why they raised an issue regarding Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what did they say Allah says in Surah 43, which is Surah Al-Zukhruf, verse number 31. وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنُ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِّنَ الْقَرْيَتَيْنِ عَظِيمٍ The kuffar of Quraysh, they said, Why didn't Allah reveal this Qur'an to a great man from one of these big cities? Which were the big cities at the time? The two major cities, Mecca and Ta'if. Mecca and Ta'if, those were the two big cities. So when Allah says Qaryatayn, He's talking of Mecca and Ta'if. Why did Allah not select a powerful man who was known for his wealth and his power and his authority and whatever else? Why did Allah choose this man? Do you know what answer Allah gave them in the Quran? 
And this answer is beautiful because we will save ourselves when we hear what Allah says to them. Allah says, Ahum rahmata rabbik. Are they the ones who distribute the mercy of Allah? Are they the ones who decide what Allah should do and should not do? Who are they? Subhanallah. Allah says, Nahnu qasamna baynahum ma'ishatahum fil hayati dunya. We are the sole ones who have decided how to distribute their livelihood amongst them. We are the ones. وَرَفَعْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ دَرَجَاتٍ And we raised some of them above others' levels. Allah raised. Sometimes you have a person who's very poor and with a very poor upbringing. Suddenly, at the age of 20, 25, they strike gold and they become so wealthy that you can't even believe. Some people become jealous. What's the statement of a jealous person? I'm sure they're pushing drugs. I'm sure you've heard that, right? Well, I hope it's not true. But by the way, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. We need to have the best thought. MashaAllah, this person's done well. Alhamdulillah, they are charitable. They are giving. SubhanAllah, who are we? What are we doing? Why become jealous? Protect yourselves. Have a good heart. Think good about people. Think sweet things. Think beautiful things. Think that which is divinely inspired. Don't think things which are from the devil. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. It's quite easy to ask yourself, what I'm thinking about, is it divinely inspired? Is it heavenly? Do I think Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa would have thought this way? If the answer is no, throw it out. Throw it out. Replace it with that which you would believe Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa would have thought and done and said. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our lives easy. May he make us an asset to our families, our communities and to the ummah at large. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِيَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا سُخْرِيًّا The test is that some of them may mock at others because they are higher and lower. That is all part of the test. So you have the people who are high, they laugh at the people who are low. Why? If they do that, they fail the test. Allah says, we gave you to test you. And we did not give you to test you. We raised you to test you. We dropped you to test you. People are worried about reputation. You know, my reputation in society and community. Trust me, if your reputation with Allah is intact, forget about what society thinks of you. What did they think of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Prior to his nubuwa, they said, as sadiqul amin, the trustworthy, the truthful. As soon as he came out with the truth, they accused him of being a womanizer, a person after money, person after authority. They accused him of so many different things. They said, madman, magician, na'udhu billah, may Allah safeguard us. Did that harm his reputation? The whole community was calling him bad names. Did it harm his reputation? No. Why? Because over time they realized, he was innocent. He was the man who came chosen from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver a beautiful message that has lasted and shall last right up to the end. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. Amen. So those are some beautiful verses regarding jealousy and how we need to save ourselves. Then we have Surah Al-Dukhan. In Surah Al-Dukhan, the opening verses speak about Laylatul Qadr. Allah calls it, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatin mubarakah. In another place in the Quran, Surah Al-Qadr, Allah says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatin qadr. So Laylatul Qadr is also called Laylatun Mubarakatun in the Quran. The, the way to translate the Quran in the highest, on the highest level is, to find another verse in the Quran that explains one of the verses. So in, in this verse, you will find Allah explains Laylatul Qadr. What is the meaning of Qadr? Qadr is actually from Taqdeer. Taqdeer means destiny. So you have your destiny is written according to Surah Al Dukhan. And you can check it, verse number three of the Surah, Allah says, Fiha yufraqu kullu amrin hakim. Verse number three and four, Allah says, on the night of Laylatul Qadr, the decree, the details of the destiny for the entire year to come is written. That's what Allah says in the Quran. So it's amazing. We say Laylatul Qadr and we only call it the night of power, not realizing it is actually the night of decree and the night of power. Because Qadr 
two things taqdeer and qudra qudra also means the power of allah allahu ala kulli shay'in qadir allah is indeed upon all things able so the power of allah together with the decree of allah those two together give you laylatul qadr and that is why it is more powerful and more blessed than 1000 months which equivalents eight, which is equal to 84 odd years powerful make dua ask allah sustenance seek his forgiveness be on the right terms on the right page towards the end of ramadan i promise you your entire year will be set by the will of allah these 10 days concentrate work hard make an effort come to the masjid soften your heart seek the forgiveness of allah ask him sustenance ask him good health ask him your children ask him the hereafter ask him about so many things in these 10 nights do not become lazy you will save yourself from a lot of calamity and disaster for the coming year because this is explained in the Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. I thought I'd just take a moment in order to explain Laylatul Qadr. It is the night of decree and the night of the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decree for us that which is absolutely beautiful for the coming year and years and for our lives obviously one might say look the decree was written already before i was born yes but the details are given by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every year and here is the day and the night may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease please go back and look at it surah number 44 of the quran verse number three and four where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains this night of power and the mufassireen are unanimous that this is speaking about Laylatul Qadr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every one of us. Then we move on to Surah Al-Ahqaf. There is, there is mention made of how important our parents are. I spoke about it the other day. I'm not going to go into too much detail tonight. But verse number 15 speaks about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has encouraged us to be kind to our parents, no matter what. And Allah says, your mother has carried you difficulty upon difficulty, hardship upon hardship, pain upon pain. The heavier you became, the more burdensome you were in her womb, but the happier she became. The less she could walk, the happier she was that you were growing within her. She became so subhanallah she started carrying you such that she could not walk properly but she was happy that you grew and then you were born and 40 years later you disrespect her is that the recompense disobedience disrespect unkind subhanallah more than disobedience it's unkindness you obey your parents on condition that they don't ask you to do something ridiculous or something that is in contrast with that which allah has revealed but kindness whether they've asked you to do haram or halal you can respond in a kind manner you can be kind always so remember this and this is why allah says the most blessed from amongst us are those whom when we get to the age of 80 sorry when we get to the age of 40 we make a dua to allah حتى إذا بلغ أشده وبلغ أربعين سنة قال رب أوزعني أن أشكر نعمتك The dua being made at the age of 40 Oh my Rabb, grant me the ability to thank you for the gifts that you have bestowed upon me and my parents and grant me the ability to do good deeds that you will be pleased with and help me so that my offspring, those to come after me, can be pure and good. Subhanallah. Allah says, those are the ones whom we accept them into our mercy. We forgive them. We will grant them Jannah. Because they've understood that we created them. And to create them, we chose parents for them. We chose them. When Allah chooses something, it's a test for you. That's what it is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every one of us. And this is why, subhanallah, we have two verses. One where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to bear patience. Yet he was very patient. Because patience, my brothers and sisters, is a quality that we all need. Allah says in verse number 35 of Surah Al-Ahqaf, which is Surah 46 of the Quran. Allah says, Fasbir kama sabara ulul azmi min rusul Bear patience just like the previous messengers. You know, the five of the strongest of the messengers. They bore patience. One of them was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do you want to know the other four? Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, 
Isa alayhi salatu was salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of them. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِيثَاقَهُمْ وَمِنْكَ وَمِنْ نُوحٍ وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى بَنِ مَرْيَمْ Allah speaks of the covenant taken. The Prophet Noah, Nuh alayhi salam. The Prophet Ibrahim, the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, the Prophet Musa alayhi salatu was salam. These were the highest in rank, subhanallah. And Allah says, bear patience just like they were patient. The lesson is for every one of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us patience. I end with the verse of Surah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the 47th surah of the Quran where Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِن تَنصُرُوا اللَّهَ يَنصُرْكُمْ وَيُثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَكُمْ O you who believe, if you are to answer the call of Allah, if you are to rush to where Allah has asked you to be, Allah will help you, Allah will assist you, Allah will strengthen you on earth. So you need to come towards Allah and Allah will come towards you even quicker than you. A hadith of the Prophet says, whoever walks towards Allah, Allah rushes towards him. Subhanallah. Whoever comes a foot towards Allah, Allah comes, whoever comes a handspan towards Allah, Allah comes towards him a whole foot. The question I have, are we making an effort to get closer to Allah? If we are, trust me, Allah will become even closer to us than we can imagine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala become closer.